Welcome back to the Dr. Cliff Show. In this episode, we're talking about the best way to treat your noise-induced hearing loss. Coming up. episode of the Dr. Cliff Show. I'm Cliff Olson, doctor of audiology and founder of Applied Hearing Solutions in Phoenix, Arizona, and I am joined with my co-host. Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Rachel Cook. Thank you for joining us again. Um, so starting straight out of the gate again with a statistic here about noise-induced hearing loss. Somewhere between 10 and 40 million adults have a hearing loss that was caused by exposure to loud sounds. And even children, one in eight children under the age of 18 already have a noise-induced hearing loss as well. And so uh, if you're watching today, make sure you stay tuned in for the rest of the episode. But if you'd like a little bit of context for this conversation, you got to go back to last week's episode where we talked all about the prevalence of noise-induced hearing loss, just how loud is too loud, and also the ways that you can protect your hearing. Um, and we're going to continue that discussion today by reviewing how noise exposure damages your hearing and really what can be done to treat it from there. Uh, as always, we will be closing out by answering questions from our uh, live comments section. So make sure that if you have any questions or any comments, drop them in the comments nice and early so that we can answer them. And also, we just both wanted to say a happy birthday to Ashley. It's Ashley's birthday today. You can't see her, but she's here. And um, so make sure that you show her some love. Make sure you click like and subscribe. And if you've got any happy birthday comments to drop in the comments for her, definitely drop them there to let her know. Now's the time to embarrass her if we can. So Most happy definitely. birthday, Ashley. <laughs> Um, all right, so let's just go ahead and jump right in. Let's get into our first sponsor now. Yes. Guys, uh, sponsors make this show possible, so show them a little bit of love as well. So noise-induced hearing loss uh, definitely makes hearing and background noise substantially more difficult. And background noise continues to be the number one concern for individuals with hearing loss. Uh, the Resound Omnia hearing aid was designed for better speech understanding in background noise. In fact, they show that they have 150% better speech understanding in noise than their previous generation technology. Now, these devices are rechargeable. They are Bluetooth. Uh, you can also get them in non-rechargeable if that's what you prefer. And uh, they are just fantastic hearing aids. I can't tell you how many times that I've worn hearing aids in complex listening situations and these hearing aids really do a fantastic job assuming they are fit and programmed appropriately so if you guys want more information on the resound omnia hearing aids make sure that you check out resound.com i also have several videos talking about the resound omnia technology on my channel so check those out as well all right, so we got to get into like what actually causes noise-induced hearing loss, yeah, don't we? Yeah, yeah. So just like Dr. Cook was saying last week, we actually talked about uh, the prevalence of noise-induced hearing loss and things that you could do to prevent you from getting hearing loss yourself. Um, but what we didn't go into yet is exactly why noise causes so much damage and causes damage in a particular way right. with your hearing. So I'm going to jump into, we have this massive ear model right in front of my computer here. And we're gonna zoom in on that because I'm gonna kind of explain how I'm usually explaining it to patients inside of the clinic. So sound is a vibration and that vibration will enter into the ear canal. That vibration will travel through to the eardrum right here and vibrate the eardrum. It will send that vibration through these three middle ear bones and into the cochlea, which is your hearing organ. And inside of that little coil that you can see right there, that has a bunch of fluid and it has a membrane. And then all along the membrane, you have these hair cells called outer hair cells that will enhance the vibration of that sound to take that sound up to your brain. So that is the anatomy of how the ear works. We also have something called inner hair cells in there as well. But when we're talking about noise-induced hearing loss, we're really focusing on the outer hair cell functionality here. Now, I do want to bring up a, an actual graphic of what hair cells look like. And we got it up there on the screen. So the top half of the screen, you have what are healthy hair cells. So at the very top, you have the IHCs, which are inner hair cells. And then on the bottom half there, you have the OHCs, which are outer hair cells. So if we look at the top to start, you can see all of those three rows of outer hair cells are looking very healthy. Same thing with the inner hair cells above them. But if you look at image B on the bottom of the screen, you can see that those OHCs, those outer hair cells, have been damaged significantly. And that's what occurs when you expose yourself 
to really loud sounds. Now I also, we're gonna, we're gonna come back to outer hair cells here in a second, but what I really wanna cover right now is this idea of ear canal peak resonance. Mm -hmm. So when we start looking at the ear canal anatomy like I was showing here is that we have a funneling effect that occurs with the ear canal and it actually increases the amplitude of sound usually around 2700 hertz. And we do have a graphic for this that shows the ear canal resonance, there we go. And there's a lot of variables that go into calculating and finding out how much this uh, amplification effect is yeah. with an individual. But when you start adding up all of those together, you end up getting this ear resonance that you can see with the solid black line right there. Yep. And on average, most individuals have an ear canal resonance of around 2700 hertz. And so when you experience loud noise exposure, the vast majority of damage that happens to your structures, to your outer hair cells, happens inside of that frequency range. And we can actually identify that in an audiogram, but we won't get to that yet because Dr. Cook has a very compelling example of what happens when noise exposure uh, ensues. I sure do. So I brought my handy dandy craft supplies today. Um, this was shown to me by one of my professors at, at UT Austin. Her name is Dr. Carey. She's awesome. And this demonstration really helps to conceptualize what's going on with the outer hair cells because we talk about the outer hair cells are damaged, they're damaged, they're damaged, but when you don't know what those are or what they even look like, it can be hard to figure out why is this causing so much damage, right? So I wanted to make sure that um, you had some as well for this demonstration. Oh yeah, okay, here so, we go. I've never done this before. So. No, so we are going to pretend that all of these pipe cleaners here are the outer hair cells that we just saw on the picture previously. They were all in those nice little rows, right? And so anytime that we're normally hearing sound, we do have this membrane that sits just lightly on top of the hair cells. And as the sound comes in and out of the ear, these hair cells move. And the way that they move, it tells our brain what we're hearing. Uh, and where we're hearing it, frequency specific, right? But now, I want you to think of a super loud noise exposure, right? So think your music festivals, gunfire, things like that. Um, and this is gonna come through and it's just gonna mess these guys up. Just uh, about boy. like that. That's messed up. Okay, <laughs> so after this loud noise exposure, you end up with hair cells that look like this. And you can even have a temporary hearing loss from noise exposure, and it, it results in something called a temporary threshold shift. And over time, your hair cells are gonna try to stand back up again, so you can try and straighten them out. But the thing is, is that they never quite go back to normal. I mean, you can see I am, I am trying as, as I might. You did better than me. It's Yeah, yours are looking really rough over there. Uh, I went so, to a really loud concert. Yeah, a really, really loud concert. And so what you end up with is these hair, these hair cells, they've stood back up again, um, but they're just not quite right. Now take a lifetime of those exposures, right? So that's just one time that it happens. If it happens 20 more times, 30 more times, 40 more times, I mean, an entire lifetime of exposure, at the end of the day, I mean, you're going to end up with just not a whole lot, right? So what you're saying is they just, they never go back to normal. They never like, go back to normal. You might think that they've gone back and mm -hmm. they've recovered to some degree, which yep. is temporary threshold shift. But if you get into this world of permanent threshold shift, which really only does take one time. Just once. Um, I mean, I have a, a patient who came in who was 17 years old, who went out to the desert shooting one time to get ready for army boot camp and damaged his hearing so bad that he couldn't get into boot camp yep. anymore. So yep. just That's one time. Unfortunate common story that we run into in clinic. And so this demonstration really shows you that even though they have gone and they've stood back up again, they're damaged and they are now more vulnerable and more susceptible to further damage in the future. So this is why we put such a big focus on hearing protection last episode. Um, it's really because it, all it takes is one of those exposures and and suddenly you end up with with all of that damage yeah so. and it's really crazy i mean i know we're working with pipe cleaners here but these are microscopic hair mm -hmm. cells so when you start thinking of of really like going at them with a lot of noise exposure you're causing a lot of damage to these really tiny little structures right and i mean you saw and and can we bring that graphic back up with the outer hair cells and inner hair cells and the damage that was caused with them uh, when you look at this graphic here, you can see those hair cells that are missing, the OHCs at the bottom, those are never coming back. 
And there is research out there right now trying to figure out how to regrow those hair cells, and all of it has been unsuccessful at this point. There's right. been some things that have shown maybe some promise with regrowing those OHCs, uh, but by and large, uh, once they're gone, they're gone, and right. you're just not getting them and back. And you look at that one on the bottom, right, and it is like a tornado went through there. Absolutely. And, and that is very likely due to a lifetime of loud noise exposures where just repeated occurrences are, are in some instances, those hair cells are completely gone, right? Like they're not even there and damaged they're absent they are they have died out in that region and the craziest thing is is that of course we expect adults to be exposed to a lot of noise over the course of their lifetime mm -hmm. but with all of everyone wearing these earbuds and playing music really loud yeah. at any moment through your smartphone into oh, your yeah. ears there's no surprise why one in eight children in the united states have noise induced hearing loss at right. this point um, and to think that they have to go still through a lifetime of additional noise exposure through other other things um, they could be in a really bad position once they get to the point where they're starting to have you know difficulty hearing uh, and and at a younger age Most than definitely. someone would expect because everyone definitely. just thinks that hearing loss is a is an age related thing and it's not I right. mean I was diagnosed with hearing loss when I was 19 years old going into Marine Corps boot camp so yeah. um, it can definitely happen to anybody at any at any time for sure so we actually have an example of what a noise induced hearing loss looks like on an audiogram because there's actually some patterns to it that, um, that we can see and so if you look up at the screen there this is going to be a, a copy of an audiogram we've got the red circles showing thresholds in the right ear we got the blue x's showing responses or thresholds in the left ear and overall pretty symmetrical hearing loss but up at the top you can see that there's frequency and on the left hand side that is going to be lower pitch sounds and as we move over to the right hand side we start moving into those more high-pitched sounds, and you see with pretty much all noise-induced hearing losses, this really characteristic notch, and it is literally referred to as a noise notch, or a noise-induced notch. Um, and that is because you see this downtrend at 4,000 hertz, between three and 4,000 hertz, and then you see this level of recovery or this bounce back. And that is showing how, just how much of that damage occurs in that particular frequency range. Um, it generally occurs about a half octave above the peak resonance, so a little bit above 2.7 K hertz, um, and then rebounds right back up again. And yeah. that is where that damage occurred. And you, you can see it with seriously every person that comes in, even when they say, oh, I haven't been exposed to too much loud noise, right? You see that notch pop up on the audiogram and you're like, what have yeah, you Yeah, tell me been more, doing? what did you leave out? Right? Yes, <laughs> and then they say something along the lines of, oh, well, you know, I, I shot a lot of guns as a kid, right. or I worked with a lot of farm equipment, and then I'm like, mm, there it is. Yep, characteristic. It's, I mean, yep. you pull it out. And, and some people don't have it. I mean, yep. some people have exposed themselves to noise to even tons. and don't have it. To tons, yeah. Uh, but anytime that noise was the culprit, we can usually identify that. And then you start combining that with age as well. Those high frequencies start to dip down. Right. Um, but when we look at it, you know, we just looked at severity. We also need to take a look at the missing speech sounds yeah. as well, because this is really where the issue lies with a lot of individuals who have noise-induced hearing loss. Um, what we have up on the screen right now, those letters, they're actually a combination of letters and we call them phonemes. When you combine those phonemes together, they create words. But any of those speech components, those phonemes that are above the X's and the O's are no longer audible anymore. So we're going to put a gray overlay over those speech components that are no longer audible. There we go. Uh, to you if you have this type of a noise induced hearing loss. Now, the problem with this is, is that those shaded gray region letters there are sounds that can no longer naturally make it from your ears up to your brain due to the damage of the outer hair cells. Now you might be thinking, well, that's only a small portion of this speech information. What about everything below that uh, in lower frequencies um, and all the, in the white region there? All of those sounds are still audible to you if you have this type of hearing loss. The problem is, is that those are the speech components that give you perception of volume. So right. low frequency sounds give perception of the vowel sounds, which give you volume. The higher frequencies are the consonant sounds, which give you clarity. So someone with this particular type of noise-induced hearing loss, they would often report, you know, I can hear when people are talking to me. I just can't understand what the heck they're saying. Right. And uh, sometimes we'll use the analogy in clinic as well about 
uh, like Wheel of Fortune, right? So you watch the show Wheel of Fortune, you get a certain amount of letters up on the board and a certain amount you have to guess. And when you have a, a hearing loss of any kind, but even particularly with those high pitched consonant sounds, the consonants are really the make or break of the message, right? The vowels are what give you that, that shape or the envelope of the speech, but the consonants are what, I mean, think of the words fat and sat and that and cat and vat, and I could go on and on. Uh, it's that one single sound that changes the meaning of the word in that sentence. And so exactly that, when you have this high pitch loss, the clarity is what's compromised from that. And that can make it really difficult to follow a conversation. Absolutely. And, th and if you want to add insult to injury on this one, I did make a mention earlier with our first sponsor, Resound, that individuals who have noise-induced hearing loss have a lot of difficulty in background noise. Yeah. And I do want to bring up that graphic again that has the shaded gray region back up on the screen and the reason I do is because these high frequency consonant sounds that are in the shaded gray region those are what our brain uses to separate speech from background noise and if you were to walk into a restaurant and measure the background noise we would identify that it isolates more in the low frequency range well individuals who've sustained noise exposure they typically have good low frequency hearing right. which means they can hear the background noise really well yep but they don't have the high frequency speech components to start separating the speech from the noise. Exactly. So you, you might think that maybe even in quiet, you feel like you can do good if you can see the mouth of the person talking to you or as long as they're not walking away from you. But you get into a background noise situation with a noise induced hearing loss and that's where everybody starts falling apart. Totally, totally. They'll say like, um, like exactly what you said, I do great in all of these other settings and the second I get into background noise, I, I can't hear anything right and that's got to be kind of concerning to, to folks who are like why is it only here why is it only in this restaurant right so uh definitely a characteristic of noise induced hearing loss is that background noise and, for and sure. this is just Difficulty. one example of the type of hearing loss that that we have i mean you can have a milder level of noise induced hearing mm -hmm. loss in this and you can also have a more severe uh, level of noise induced hearing loss than this. So it might start off where you're having very minor levels of difficulty, but as it starts progressing over time, as you do more and more damage mm -hmm. to those hair cell structures, it's just going to get worse and worse as time goes on. Most definitely. So we're going to jump into our next sponsor segment here. We've got Sound Oasis. So if you have tinnitus, and perhaps you have tinnitus from loud noise exposure, right? Uh, you know quiet environments can definitely make that tinnitus much, much more noticeable. So Sound Oasis has an entire lineup of sound generator products to help out with that, um, specifically their BST100 speaker. I use the speaker every single night. I love it. It comes preloaded with about 15 different sounds that you can use to play all night long to add a little bit of sound conditioning to your environment keep your ears stimulated so that the perception of the tinnitus or the ringing in the ears is not as loud or as noticeable. Uh, the BST100 also streams music from any of your Bluetooth devices, your phone, your computer, and you can also visit the app store where Sound Oasis has an entire lineup of different tinnitus sound generator apps as well. Uh, and the light version is free, but if you purchase any of the products, you do get access to the pro version at no additional cost to you. So make sure you visit soundoasis.com and use promo code SLEEP. That will get you 20% off of any of their products. And thank you so much to Sound Oasis. Awesome, Sound Oasis. Thank you. Now, before we get into our Hearing Up provider spotlight here, I do want to, again, remind you guys to ask your questions. If you have oh, questions yeah. about the things that we're talking about, put them in the comment section below. We're going to have some time to answer some of those questions you have to make sure that it's contextual to the topic we're talking about this so if you true. ask some off the wall question that's still a good question you can ask it but the chances of it being answered on this show are much lower but we will do future shows where we're just going and answer all of your questions so don't hold back if you have something that's off topic you can still ask that as well and show us a little bit of love if you have that click button handy or that like button handy go ahead and click on that to give us a like on the show uh, and give us that support now we are going to jump into our hearing up provider spotlight um, to give you guys an idea of what hearing up is it is a network of hearing care professionals who are committed to following best practices uh, with treating hearing loss and that includes noise induced 
hearing loss. So we have uh, this network that's nationwide. If you are looking for an outstanding provider near you, make sure that you check out hearingup.com. But who do we have today for our Hearing Up Provider Spotlight? Today, we have got Dr. Natalie Phillips. So Dr. Phillips received her undergraduate in communication disorders and speech sciences at the University of Colorado at Boulder. She then went on to get her master's in audiology at the University of Hawaii, and then her doctorate through the University of Florida. She, has, she is now the owner of the Audiology Center of Northern Colorado in Fort Collins, Colorado, and she's been practicing audiology for 26 years. Now, she sent me her bio and her CV. Holy moly, she has got so much going on, right? So I can't, I can't fit it all in here, but she has served on the board of Colorado Academy of Audiology. She also has a particular focus on um, tinnitus treatment and, and treating <clears throat> sound sensitivity disorders as well. And she's done that for the last 23 years. Now, she's also the host of a weekly live stream show called All Things AUD, which discusses various topics within audiology as well, which is super cool. And I'm going to be on her show here, I think, in a couple of weeks. So oh, make nice. sure that you guys go and check that out and subscribe to that channel as well. Definitely. And the last little thing I want to throw in here is that she's also the author of a book that's titled Act Now, A Simple Guide to Take Action on Your Greatest Goals and Dreams. She's also a, a co-author on another book as well called One Habit. And she has a podcast called Connecting a Better World. So like fully loaded, fully, fully loaded. Yeah, you're I not love kidding, it. For sure. So hi, Dr. Phillips. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, thanks for having me. Absolutely. So we're doing a lot of talking here about uh, noise-induced hearing loss. How often do you see noise-induced hearing loss in your clinic? So first of all, great job. I loved listening and watching the pipe cleaners. I've never seen that before. <laughs> so I just had this huge grin on my face. I loved it. It was a great, great, great type of like um, method to teach that about hair cells. So great job. Thank um, you. For my practice, um, my practice is very medically based. And so we actually work with a lot of different physicians. But what's interesting is when we talk about noise induced hearing loss and how to treat it, I think what's super important to know is that most people think of the industrial employment, the industrial workers, right? Um, but we have musicians come in, we've got dentists, so I've got dental hygienists come in, concert goers, like you guys talked about, shooters. But then also, I'm not too sure people think about this, but we work with a brain concussion specialist and brain mm -hmm. injuries. And so people that are in accidents, and so typically when we see people with uh, noise-induced hearing loss, it could be any of those that, that I just mentioned. And so we normally start off with obviously doing a hearing test. If we see that you've got that high frequency hearing loss like you guys have shown, then we do annual hearing tests. We talk about um, hearing aids if they're needed, the open fit type that can focus more on those higher pitches and we don't need to have those lower pitches um, or those lower frequencies um, amplified. And then typically, like I've talked about musicians' earplugs, um, especially with my musicians, my dentists, and my hygienists as well. Mm -hmm. And then you've got those people that I've talked about in accidents with sound sensitivity. So there's a caveat with these brain injury patients um, that they may, may have had noise-induced hearing loss from a car accident, right? That airbag deploys and it's super loud and they've got tinnitus and they've got sound sensitivity. So with that, I wanted to throw in that, that there are also those types of people that with noise-induced hearing loss that I might have to treat with tinnitus or sound sensitivity and look at other forms of treatment. So I thought that would be kind of interesting to bring up as well. For sure. And we didn't really touch base a whole lot on the tinnitus side of it, but you know, tinnitus and noise induced hearing loss typically go hand in hand. Right. Um, do you get really involved in the tinnitus treatment inside of your clinic? And if you do, how do you go about do, uh, doing those treatments? Yes, absolutely. So tinnitus and sound sensitivity are like the, it's one of the things in audiology that I absolutely love. So they come to me, they come to me from different states to see me for tinnitus and sound sensitivity. And really what we do is we do a consult, we do an evaluation, and I stick with some of the methods that I've learned through tinnitus retraining therapy with Dr. Yasterboff, and we do sound therapy where I'm teaching them how to use either devices 
um, during the day. So it could be sound generators included with their hearing aids, as well as a tabletop sound generator that they would use at night. And so we're teaching them how to ha live in a sound enriched environment in order to help them reduce their awareness and disturbance of tinnitus. And then also looking at the sound sensitivity, because even though, you know, tinnitus can go hand in hand with noise induced hearing loss, so can sound sensitivity. So we want to look yeah. at that too and be very careful about what we're doing. Absolutely. Sure. Um, you know, since this is the, the Hearing Up uh, Spotlight segment, um, we see a lot of individuals coming in who've had noise-induced hearing loss. They may have even had that noise-induced hearing loss treated with hearing aids, but they're still not having success. And it seems like the missing component, at least inside of our clinic, is that they never had best practices followed through that treatment. So you're part of the Hearing Up Provider Network that is committed to following best practices. So explain to me, uh, uh, to all the viewers and, and listeners, uh, of why best practices are so important to you to follow inside of your clinic. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, first of all, I love the question why. I think I just had a conversation about the question why this morning and about, you know, four questions that you can ask yourself. Number one, it would be like, why? The straight up question of why, like, why do we do best practices, right? Why is it important? Well, this is what we do. I can give you a simple answer. Like, this is what we were trained to do as an audiologist. But then you want to ask yourself, like, why not the antithesis, right? Like, why not be the best? Why not provide the best? Third question would be, why not you? Like more specifically, why not be a practice that is providing the best? And then the last question is, why not now? Like no one finishes at the finish line without starting at the starting line. So why not, why aren't you doing this now? And even if you aren't, just start, right? And so being part of the Hearing Up Network is huge. I mean, we've already been doing this, but to be able to be a, with a network of people that I can either refer to, you guys can refer to that are not here, and that the patients don't have to travel is huge. I love your um, diagram about real ear because one of my favorite things in doing best practices is real ear measurements. And like you showed, you know, even though the natural ear canal resonance is at 2,700 hertz. Noise induced hearing loss is kind of like at that drop and that notch of 4,000 hertz. Mm -hmm. And then, even then, Dr. Galloway and I, in our practice, we did um, a show and we took a hearing loss, we programmed a hearing aid, and we did realer measurements on my right ear, my left ear, on her right ear, and her left ear. And every single um, response was different. So it was the same person different ears was different. And then my, obviously, my ear canal resonance was different from Dr. Galloway's. So it's super important, like real ear measurements is huge. And that's one of the things that I stand by in it being kind of a practice that does best practices. And that's one of the, my most favorite things to see because of exactly like what you showed today in that diagram, I loved it. Well, you better hang tight because you are about to see exactly what you just explained with my own ear canal and real ear measurements for that. So that's yeah. perfect because we agree and that's the only way to really verify it. Like you said, even just between your own two ear canals, even if the hearing loss is exactly symmetrical between ears, your ear canal can be different. And when it's different, it's changing the peak resonance, which is changing how the whole fitting is going to go. And it's really impossible if you're not following best practices to even identify this. And, yep. and essentially it, it takes you from being a cookie cutter provider where you're just gonna administer the same exact treatment to everybody and use estimates and guesses about how you're treating them. And you're actually using evidence-based practice where you're making it very specific to the individual that you're treating. And I think that obviously uh, any provider, uh, including ourselves who are involved in the Hearing Up Network, we all believe the same philosophy. I mean, we know how important it is to follow best practices, and I'm glad to have you on board with that. Definitely. Definitely. Thank you. Well, Thank please you. tell any of our viewers where they can find you. Yeah, absolutely. So um, you can find me right down there on the screen uh, where it says audiologycenternoco.com, or um, we are on Facebook, Audiology Center NOCO, Instagram, same thing, as well as Twitter and YouTube. So that's where you can find us. Awesome. Awesome. And I know I've sent people there already, yeah. and um, I believe you've even sent me people down, down here in <laughs> Phoenix. So we appreciate that. It kind of goes both ways. Um, I love it. Well, thank you so much for joining us. This has been a pleasure, and I can't wait to be on your podcast here in a few weeks. Yay. Thank you, guys. Absolutely. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. Awesome. All right. So love her. She actually was yeah. down here 
uh, in Phoenix. I know, I just missed her. Yeah, yeah, she was down here in Phoenix a couple weeks ago. We got to catch up a little bit. She she came in really quick to help out uh, doing some filming and mm -hmm. things like that for a project we're working on, and then uh, she had to get right back up right. because um, uh, Dr. Galloway, who's in their clinic, uh, actually gave uh, birth to a, a, a beautiful baby and, and spending some time with her so she's not in the clinic. So Dr. Phillips has her plate full with treating all of their patients inside of their clinic. So, um, we're lucky she could join us today then. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, now let's go ahead and jump into our next uh, sponsor here. So now here's the thing. I don't ride motorcycles. I do ride bicycles. But I, um, when you are riding a motorcycle, if you are riding a motorcycle, and you end up taking your helmet off and losing your hearing aid, you would be just like another patient that we had who lost their hearing aid and had to file their loss and damage claim to get their hearing aid back. Now that's not the end of the world, right? Because you filed this loss and damage claim, you get your hearing aid back. The problem is you can only do that one time with your hearing aid manufacturer and then after that you're having to buy an entirely new hearing aid so if you take your helmet off a second time and you lose that hearing aid uh, you're gonna be out of luck and that is exactly why you need ESCO so ESCO specializes in providing loss and damage and repair insurance coverage to your hearing aids so you don't have to pay for expensive repairs or buy new hearing aids before you're ready they do have a variety of different coverage plans that you can check out on their website and get an exact quote for your exact hearing aids. If you go to esco.com forward slash Dr. Cliff, Dr. Cliff Show viewers will get a $10 Visa gift card just for registering your hearing aids. So you basically enter in your serial numbers and they will notify you when your warranty is about to expire. So thank you, Esco. And uh, just be careful if you're riding your motorcycle and you take your helmet off. Yeah, in theory, you should be removing the hearing aids and using hearing protection on a motorcycle anyway, but I'll leave that for you another You know, time. some of these helmets are pretty good nowadays with noise yeah, suppression, actually, and true. if you mute your hearing aids because you don't want to take them out and put them in your lint-filled pocket, yeah. I mean, there's definitely scenarios that you could find yourself there in. There are workarounds. <laughs> there are workarounds for sure. So we're going to jump straight back into that last audiogram that we had pulled up with the speech sounds that are shaded there because we were talking about okay, here is what this hearing loss configuration looks like. And now we got to talk about what do we do about it, right? And Dr. Phillips actually segued into this conversation so perfectly. You'd think that we hired her to do that um, because first of all, she's talking about using an open fit hearing aid. And what she means by that really is actually the acoustic coupling on the end of a, like a receiver in canal hearing aid. So perfect. We've got a picture up on the screen there. So every type of hearing aid is going to have different acoustic characteristics to it and with a custom hearing aid there's custom venting and things that go on with that we're going to talk about that shortly um, but with a receiver and canal or a non-custom type of a hearing aid you're going to have to put some sort of dome on the end of that device and the dome the silicone piece there is basically number one keeping the hearing aid in your ear in place where it needs to be um, but there's a bunch of perforations around the perimeter of that silicone dome there and those perforations are really to allow low natural low frequency or low pitch sounds into the ear but also allow them back out of the ear naturally so that your own voice and things like that come through as natural as possible while still delivering a good amount of high pitch high frequency amplification at the same time absolutely and let's jump back to the speech sounds in the shaded region there because mm -hmm. I want to drive this point home even a little bit more so those letters that are in the white region there those would enter those those sounds would enter through those open perforations of that open dome and vibrate your eardrum the exact same way it would do it naturally right all right and it doesn't affect them in any way shape or form but what the hearing aid then allows you to do is blend in in the appropriate amount of high frequency amplification to take all of those letters that are in the shaded gray region and return them back to your brain. Mm -hmm. So essentially you're using some of your natural hearing that has not been damaged and you're using some of the amplified sound from the hearing aid to treat the hearing loss that you have. And again, this is very specific to an individual's hearing loss. Mm -hmm. And so you actually did real ear measurements to identify things like ear canal resonance yep. that you have, as well as uh, an initial setting, like a default setting of a hearing aid for a hearing loss, but then you customize it as well. So let's go ahead and jump into yeah. all of those examples. Yes, let's do it. So. Um, Basically, what you're looking at on the screen on the left-hand side, or that orange curve there, 
That is a probe microphone measurement. And what I mean by that is we take a very skinny, soft microphone tube and we place it down into our ear canal. And that allows us to measure exactly the amount of sound that's going into the ear canal. And when I had no hearing aid on or anything like that, just my own natural ear, you see a solid line on that left-hand side, and that is showing just the amount of essentially amplification or ear canal resonance with nothing in my ear at all. So you can see on the bottom, it shows you the, the frequencies, and by frequency, you can see just how much my own ear canal was naturally boosting things up. And if you'll look right around that 2000 hertz-ish range, uh, we see a nice little peak there in my natural. Yeah, so your resonance is a little bit a little lower, bit lower than the average, which is 2,700 hertz. You're around 2,000 hertz, so about 700 hertz difference. Yep, and go, which goes to show you, again, this, is, this brings us right back to this discussion of uh, all these hearing aid manufacturers have a first fit setting um, where the hearing aid is basically they, t they take your audiogram and your age and your, and your gender and they form some calculations and they say, okay, this is probably where she's going to start out at except for the fact that right there, research shows us that our peak occurs around 2.7 kilohertz and mine was more around two. So that's gonna change the calculation for Absolutely. the amplification. And we have a picture of that as well. So that one, that pink curve on that right hand side, at this point, I did have a hearing aid in my ear and it was an open fit hearing aid. And the hash marked line that you see on the screen on the right hand side, that is actually my prescription. So I based a prescription off of the previous audiogram that we were looking at. And the solid line that we see should match up with the hash marked line. That would mean that the amount of amplification coming out of the hearing aid is matching up perfectly with my prescriptive targets or how much amplification I should need to overcome that hearing loss. As you can see in those high frequencies, the only range that they were supposed to be amplifying in. They didn't do a good job they of. They did not do a good job and of so that. And so if that solid pink line on the right hand side of the screen is not matching the pink hash mark line as closely as possible, all of those missing speech components that you're missing because of the noise induced hearing loss, you're not even getting all of those back. No. So what the heck are you wearing a hearing aid for? Well, and a lot of our patients come in asking that, right? So they'll come to us from other providers, places where they've maybe had subpar experiences, and they say, hey, I spent all this money and all of this time on hearing aids to treat this issue and it changes nothing. Well, if you just run a first fit on the devices and you don't verify anything, those high pitches that you needed right there, th you're not getting them. The, the hearing aid is not amplifying where it needs to. You're not getting the benefit that you're looking for. You're not crazy. Your hearing aid literally at that point is, is not helping you. And theirs could be set up even worse than the one that we just showed on the oh, screen for, for sure. you, which we've seen before. We've seen it. Uh, we've but seen we it. have uh, some light at the end of the tunnel here. That so we, we have another one that we can pull up here where we are showing a comparison of having a hearing aid fit to target using realer measurement versus just the hearing aid set up as first fit. So you can see that the prescription prescription hash mark line is now purple and the pink curve that's still on the screen there that's below the purple there that was the hearing aid set to default settings based on estimates that the computer thought were good for you yep and then you went ahead and had our other audiologist Dr. Balderas mm -hmm. go in and customize the audio of that hearing aid to match that uh, the purple hash mark line as closely as possible and with that purple solid line and you can see that you are hitting your prescriptive targets almost out to 6,000 hertz before it starts that natural roll off yep. in the high frequencies. That right there is as close to a perfect open fit as you will likely get with any hearing aid. For sure, for sure. So obviously again taking into account uh, you see that there's like a little bit of over amplification there in the middle right where the solid line is just slightly above the hash marked line. That's my own natural ear canal resonance. We took the amplification down in that area as far as we could and we couldn't get that to go away and that's okay. Everyone's ear canal resonance is going to play into this a little bit right. Um, but what we what I needed more than anything was a significant amount of, of high frequency amplification that I was not getting and then once we went in and very verified what the hearing aids were doing, then we were able to match targets beautifully. Now there are occasions though where an open fit hearing aid is not appropriate Definitely. for a noise induced hearing loss. And this has everything to do with the severity of someone's noise induced hearing loss. Uh, sometimes when you have an open fit, if you're trying to amplify the high frequencies way too much, that sound just leaks right back out of the hearing aid and causes a whistling effect. And we call that 
feedback. And so when you start looking at these different uh, audiograms, and let's look at another one that has a little bit increased severity here. And you can see here that this one has actually dropped down further into that moderate to severe hearing loss range, that noise notch on the screen. And so this would require us to apply more amplification through a hearing aid. But if you have those open perforations, like I said, that sound will just leak right out yeah. and you don't actually get the benefit from that. And so if we want to actually solve this particular hearing loss, and, and we can move, move through the progressions here of the missing speech components, and bring them up on the screen, very good. Now let's go ahead and progress into the shaded. So the same speech components are missing, mm -hmm. but that's not the point here. The point here is, is that you need more amplification to get these back to the brain. A significant amount more, yeah. And if you want to do this well, you have to use a custom ear mold. So we have an image of what a custom ear mold would actually look like. Now this one here uh, gives you the idea of what a custom ear mold on the tip of a hearing aid would look like. What this one does not have is a vent inside of it. So typically you would see that little white tip on the end there, that's where the sound comes out. But right below that you would have some type of a variable vent size mm -hmm. based on what that particular individual's hearing loss is. So someone right. who has a little bit less of a hearing loss, that vent could be more open. If they have more of a hearing loss, you would have to close down that vent. And so what's the process of actually getting one of these custom ear molds then? Uh, so the patient will generally need to get some ear impressions done. And it's either ear impressions with the use of silicone or uh, ear scans like we do in the clinic, 3D ear scans. And that is going to be extremely important to really getting all of the characteristics of the ear canal mapped out and ready to go um, because we need to have a really good, really perfect kind of seal in that ear canal to make sure that we can apply as much amplification as we need to, but without that risk of feedback. Absolutely, again. and if you go back and check out our episode last week, we kind of elaborated on the importance of getting a very good ear mold impression, whether it's a physical impression or a digital impression of your ear. And it has a lot to do with your configuration of hearing loss, the shape and contours of your ear canal, the size of your ear canal, that will depend on what that vent size needs to be. So you really need to make sure that you go to someone who knows what they're doing. You can't just go to some random individual to get you any old ear mold. It has to be a precision ear mold specifically designed for your noise-induced hearing loss. Most definitely. Now, the thing about uh, treating noise-induced hearing loss, right? So some individuals come into our clinic and the, the noise notch that we see on the audiogram is pretty relatively mild, right? Um, and they'll say, okay, uh, you know, it, it looks on the audiogram like it's mild, uh, so I probably don't need to do anything about it just yet, right? Um, and to that I say, no, there are plenty of benefits of treating even a mild, a moderate, a moderately severe, any type of hearing loss at all, ever. Um, a little biased on that one, but of course, uh, but we should be. But as we should be, right? You and see how impactful it is to people's lives. Even mild treatment, a, a mild hearing loss, is is a huge impact on someone's quality of life. Yeah, I just saw an individual today who uh, I had fit with hearing aids and extremely, extremely mild amounts of amplification. But he was having so much significant difficulty in his day to day life that we said, you know what, let's try it. Met with him today for a, a six week follow up. He had just finished his end of his trial period, and he was saying, my friends and my family notice that I am back and ready to be social again. I am going out to restaurants with them. I went to two conferences recently and had a great time, no struggle hearing at all. This is exactly what he was looking for. So even when the benefit level is considered mild, you can still get massive, massive gains in clarity of speech, massive gains in understanding speech and background noise, massive gains in music perception. I mean, the, the list goes on and on and on. And if you have tinnitus, the use of hearing aids can even decrease the perception of tinnitus as well. Yeah, when you look at the research, approximately six out of 10 individuals who have tinnitus get a suppression of that tinnitus, and oftentimes a significant suppression just by the use of, of hearing aids and replacing those missing high-frequency speech components. Right, Absolutely. Right. so no reason not to do it. I mean, it's, it's very clear. The reason that his family notices the difference is because he can actually hear and understand what they are saying yep. again, and not just in quiet, but in background noise as well. Definitely, definitely. 
Well, before we go to questions, which is coming right up here, so if you have any last second ones, throw them on in there, but um, we have got our last sponsor here and our final sponsor of the day is going to be Eosera. So Eosera is an entire lineup, comprehensive lineup of ear care products. They have products for ear wax, ear itch, ear pain, and more. Like I said last week, I was walk walking through CVS and they even had an earbud cleaning kit, which was pretty cool nice. because those AirPods can get a little rough sometimes. Um, we use Earwax MD in our office and we use it because it dissolves wax pretty fast, right? Still gotta flush it out of the ear after, but it's not a problem because Eosera's got their Wax Blaster Pro. They've, uh, that one's rechargeable and that one's pretty fun. Um, they've got handheld versions of it as well. Um, and so Eosera, you can get any of their products at CVS, Walgreens, Walmart, most national retailers. However, you can also get all of their products on their website, which is eosera.com. And if you use the promo code CLIFF20, you will get 20% off your entire purchase. So make sure you check them out. I'm pretty sure I give out that uh, website about three or four times a week to patients who are in my yes. clinic. I'm like, you just need to get this product from Eosera yep. because they're quality stuff. Um, the Earview MD had mm -hmm. a patient buy some off brand of that and it was horrible. Uh, and so I told him, you got to go get the Earview MD. Yes. That one is hands down the best one that you can buy. Yeah, I'll have to talk about that one next next week Absolutely. for sure. Sorry, I didn't mean to steal pictures. the thunder. It's no. a great product no, and no, I couldn't it's great. keep it in. So we have Kelsey back. Thank goodness. Back in action. <laughs> back and we can hear and understand her voice. <laughs> yes. Yes, I'm very glad to be back. I'm very glad I have my full voice ready to go. Um, great, always a great time interacting with everybody and getting to uh, interact online and collect all of your guys' questions. Uh, so the first question that we have is, in my hearing test, a tympanogram, question <laughs> mark, showed that my eardrums are overly compliant, then the peaks are way above the graph. Is that evidence of noise-induced hearing loss earlier in life? Not to my knowledge. No. 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 So uh, a tympanogram is basically testing the, it's, it's ensuring that your eardrum is intact, so making sure that there's no perforations, and then just how compliant or how mobile your eardrum actually is. Uh, there's a wide, wide range of the amount of mobility that is within the normal range. Uh, you can have really, really shallow tympanograms that just barely peak, and you can have what we call like hypermobile tympanic membranes, which is just where your eardrum moves a lot. Mm -hmm. um, generally, if your eardrum is intact, it doesn't really matter how much it moves. Uh, if it moves too, too, too much, maybe there's an issue behind the eardrum with the middle ear bones, um, but no, that generally is not evidence of any noise-induced I mean, loss. unless you're talking about a concussive blast, uh, someone mm -hmm. hit with an IED in the military, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, but that's more so than just the noise. That's literally just like physical damage that's yeah. occurring, not just inside the ear, but pretty much everywhere. Right. But I can see how it's easy to confuse. We've talked a lot about resonance today, mm -hmm. and we're showing a lot of pictures with these peaks and things like that. If you saw the results of your tympanogram, it'd be easy to think like, oh, okay, that's what we're talking about here. They look very, very, very similar. Right. However, we're measuring eardrum versus actual hearing sensitivity. Yep. So you should be good. That's a good question though. That's yeah. That's a good question. Um, the next question that I have is, does it make sense that I can't hear women and children with a noise-induced hearing loss? Is it abnormal if you can't? Yeah, does it make sense that I can't oh, hear them? Yeah, absolutely. Spot on. Yeah, that, I mean, that would be the first sign, most likely. Yeah. So it's either going to be hearing and background noise is a, is a troublesome thing, or female voices and children's voices. And there is a very specific reason behind this, and I kind of want to bring up an audiogram again. Can yeah. we bring up the audiogram with the speech sounds on there, Chris? I apologize. Uh, normally, we don't bring he up these graphics. The yeah, he, yeah, right? <laughs> Put them back to work. Perfect. Okay. So when we look at a hearing loss like this, when you're talking to a male, they are typically going to be driving more low frequency speech to you. Yep. So if you have good low frequency hearing, you're going to be good, even if you are missing their high frequency speech components, right? Because you have enough to work with at least. When you start talking to a female or a child that don't tend to drive the low frequencies, so all of those speech components in the white region on this graph, not only are you missing the high frequency speech components in the shaded gray, you start missing more of the speech components in the white region. So now you really have very little to nothing to work with with a noise induced hearing loss mm -hmm. talking to a female or a child. Yep, definitely. So that would be one of the very first things that gets reported. Perfect. 
All right, our next question is, do individuals, oh, I'm sorry, that is not our next question. I skipped one, I am sorry. Can all hearing aids treat noise-induced hearing loss or, and tinnitus, or are there ones that are better than others for this type of hearing loss? To me, this is again gonna be that uh, it totally depends on your provider and not necessarily the devices, because in, in at least in my opinion, most hearing aids are capable of accommodating for most noise-induced hearing losses. Of course, everyone's different. There's gonna be a lot of variables, so it's difficult to make just a blanket statement like that. But it, I think it's gonna be much more highly dependent on how the devices are programmed. I think too often I see patients who come in with that second audiogram that we saw that's much more severe, right? And they're in an open fit dome. And I know that that hearing aid is not capable of getting the amount of amplification needed at those frequency ranges without creating feedback. So when they're in an open dome like that, I can nearly guarantee that they're being underfit and therefore not getting that amount of benefit that they're really looking for. For sure, and there's definitely nuances to it and experience matters. So uh, everyone thinks that I'm great with every single hearing aid that's out there, but I'm, I'm good at a lot of them, I'm great at a few of them. And so when you go in to see a different provider than me, I might say, you know what, I can do a great job of treating your hearing loss with this particular make, model, brand, whatever. But if you go in to see maybe Dr. Natalie Phillips mm -hmm. up in Fort Collins, mm -hmm. Colorado, she might be very good with a different brand of hearing aid that she can knock that out of the park with. Yeah. So it really comes down to how good is the provider that you're going to? Are they following best practices when they're fitting you with that hearing aid? And you'd be much better served to spend all of your time finding the best provider in your area versus looking for the best hearing aid online. And I know that I talk about hearing aids all the time online and I'm still <laughs> telling you it is better to find a provider than to, to, than to find the hearing aid. Yeah, yeah, like m really seriously, most hearing aids can accommodate for these losses. It is just how they are programmed. And I think that that is exactly true for tinnitus perception as well. Mm -hmm. um, you, you gotta find a provider that's comfortable with it. You've gotta find a provider that knows what they're doing. You've gotta find a provider that likes working with tinnitus patients. I mean, you can tell that Dr. Natalie Phillips is most definitely Absolutely. one of those providers and she'd be an excellent person to see for all of your tinnitus needs and you just have to find a provider like that in, in your area. Excellent. All right. Well, guys, thank you so much. And, and Kelsey, it was great having you back. Yes. Love yes, I'm really glad questions. to be back in person. <laughs> awesome. All right, guys, I hope you liked the show today. Remember, check out last week's episode, uh, what, episode number 10? Yeah. Um, episode number 10, we were talking about noise-induced hearing loss as well, but more along the prevalence of it and how to prevent it. And then today, we were spending most of our time talking about well, how that actually causes hearing loss and then what you can do to treat it. So if you like this episode, guys, do us a huge favor. Click that like button. If you are not subscribed, to the channel go ahead and do that as well you can watch us every wednesday at 4 p.m arizona time get ready because the clocks are about to change here in a couple of weeks we're going to stay at the same time you guys are going to change but we're going to be four o'clock p.m arizona time every wednesday you can find us on facebook live youtube live and wtsmtv.com and as always we'll see you next week <laughs>